Monroe presiding. Thank you. Good morning. You may all be seated. Thank you, Mark Keith, on behalf of people. Good morning, Your Honor. David Williams, on behalf of people. Call up Michelle Lofton on behalf of Ethan Crumley. Amy Half on behalf of Ethan Crumley. Good morning, Your Honor. Deborah H. McKelvey on behalf of Ethan Crumley. Thank you, and good morning to all counsel. You may all be seated. Defense, ready to proceed with your next witness? Yes, if I could just have a moment to connect uh, the PowerPoint, please. Absolutely. Defense will call Dr. Colin King to the stand. Thank you. Doctor, you're going to approach the witness stand. You're going to stand in the witness box. Face my clerk to be sworn, please. Sir, if you could please state your full name for the record and spare your last name. Sure, my name is Colin King, C is in Charlie, O-L-I-N, last name King, K-I-N-G. Thank you. Defense your witness. Thank you. <coughs> Dr. King, I'll let you get situated. Let me know when you're ready. Doctor, what is your highest qualification for education? I have a PhD in counseling psychology. And where did you obtain your degree? From Wayne State University in Detroit, Michigan. What licenses do you hold? I am a fully licensed uh, psychologist, and I'm also licensed as a professional counselor, so I'm duly licensed. What certifications do you have? So I'm certified as a, a board a forensic counselor, a board certified sentence mitigation specialist, a certified advanced addiction specialist. Okay. Have you ever had your license revoked or suspended? No, ma'am. Where did you do your internship? So I did my in internship in uh, Michigan City, Indiana, and that's at a, a, a psychiatric hospital mm -hmm. um, that uh, treats uh, children adolescent and uh, adults and then I did a second internship at Southwest Detroit Community Mental Health um, working with patients with chronic mental health issues and uh, poly substance abuse. Okay. Your Honor, just for the record it appears the witness is consulting some documents. Can we just identify what those are? Thank you sir. What do you have that's currently with you on the witness stand? Sure. I submitted um, a copy of my, of my CV Thank you. And is that what you're referring to? Yes, yes. People, do you have a copy of the CV? Yes, Your Honor. He's, he's got a whole binder. I just want to make sure I understand what he's consulting. Yeah, I can absolutely you. tell you what is in my uh, binder, sir. Sure. There's no need, sir. Yeah, if you could, please set the binder aside and let's okay. specifically ask to refer to it. Okay. Thank you. You may proceed. Absolutely. Your resume indicates that you also <laughs> lectured at a number of universities. Can you describe that? 
Yes, so I, as an adjunct professor, I've lectured at Wayne State, um, Eastern Michigan University, Ashland University, and uh, University of Detroit Mercy. And what courses did you teach there? I taught classes in uh, multicultural issues and uh, psychological testing. You also worked as a special education consultant, is that correct? That is correct. And what did you do there? I consult with uh, one of the charter schools in Michigan um, doing um, IEPs and uh, psychological testing. Okay. You also have listed that you are a brain injury expert. Can you tell me about your experience treating brain injury and or mental illness? Absolutely. So I've, I've worked with a large uh, Midwestern brain injury um, facility, actually one of the largest in uh, Michigan. and. Um, over the last maybe 23 years or so, um, I have treated various forms of brain injuries, uh, mental illness, and patients with uh, poly substance abuse. Um, in fact, <coughs> I was tasked as a part of my um, assignments, tasked with supervising teams of occupational therapists, um, physical therapists, nurses, and psychologists. I've traveled to different states um, and met with uh, neurologists um, and uh, assessed patients who were injured due to maybe auto accident or spinal cord injury or stroke. Um, had an opportunity to look at their uh, medical records and review their records with physicians and then return back to Michigan and set up treatment programs for them. I also um, traveled to Loma Linda University, which is one of the largest, um, which has one of the largest cadaver labs in the nation, mm -hmm. and had an opportunity to meet with a neuropathologist and got a chance to look, look at various models of the brain to handle the brain and to see how it works. Um, I've also uh, attended various lectures at the uh, Amen Clinics and you may know he is the award winner on Change Your Brain, Change Your Life. I actually had my own brain scanned. And so that gives me my experience in brain injury. Have you ever testified in any juvenile life cases before? I have. In what counties? Um, Wayne, Macomb, Genesee, and I think Jackson. In the last three years, approximately, how many, how many juvenile lifers, homicide, or competency cases have you testified in? Probably about 24, 25. Have you been previously qualified as an expert? Yes, ma'am. Your Honor, at this time, I move to have Dr. Colin King um, as an expert in mental health, forensic psychology, and brain injury. Um, Judge, I understand he's interviewed, I'm sorry, may I judge? Yes. Uh, I understand that he's interviewed the defendant and he's here as a mitigation specialist and I don't have any in issue with that. Um, there's nothing in his report or in the record to indicate that this defendant had any kind of brain injury. Um, so I would object to his qualification on that simply because it's not relevant to this proceeding. Thank you. As it relates to any brain injury, unless there's going to be foundation laid that this defendant has brain injury, then that's not appropriate. However, I will qualify this witness as an expert in mental health and forensic psychology, is that correct? That is correct. He is so qualified. Thank you. Thank you. Right. And Your Honor, we do have a demonstrative PowerPoint uh, to explain his report. <coughs> All right, so I want to go over uh, the process that was taken. Is it working? Oh, yeah. Just move to the next one. So let's start with the process. Um, it is my understanding that you became involved in this case in December of 2022. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. That is correct. All right. Um, and can you tell me what you did first? So I... Um I spent approximately uh, 23 to 24 hours um, testing Ethan Crumley over about six sessions. And I used um, about 15 different assessments 
and I've turned in my uh, report, which is about a six to nine to seven to page report. Okay. Some of the testing, was it done in person? Yes. Yes, ma'am. And then some of the testing, was it done on computer or by Zoom? It was done virtually. Yes, ma'am. So you interviewed him um, multiple times approximately one year after the incident, a little bit longer than one year. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay. Were you also given a litany of records, videos, text messages, um, and reports to review? Yes, ma'am. Did you then do research to gather data and establish the standards that are required? I did. Here we also have that you consulted with a Dr. Malcolm Court uh, that is a sociologist. Why is it important to peer review? Well, because I wanted uh, a different discipline to look at my work and to provide me feedback on my work. I wanted to make sure that it was not just my personal opinion, but that my work was based on um, testing and solid scientific evidence. Right. And Your Honor, I draw your attention to um, Exhibit O, the CV of Dr. Malcolm Court, and Exhibit P, the report of Dr. Malcolm Court, uh, which reviews Dr. King's findings. Thank you. Mm -hmm. You want to move to the next one? Judge, if I may, I, I believe we stipulated the admission of exhibits with the understanding Dr. Court was a witness. And so I had some questions for Dr. Court, and now it's but it sounds like he's not going to testify. So I have an issue with the court using his report as a basis, as evidence in this case, um, without the chance to cross-examine. So Dr. Court was not listed on my witness list. Um, I did have conversations with Mr. Keese, the fact that Mr. Court would not be called. This should not be a surprise at all. And they did not object to my exhibits. Okay. Judge, I'll do with this to weigh the, the evidence the court should consider. Thank you. Thank you. The court will apply the appropriate weight, noting that the doctor will not be testified. Thank seat. you. So as a brief overview, um, what is it that you looked at in regards to this case um, to form an opinion? Sure. So I looked at uh, Ethan's uh, early life. I looked at, at the uh, parental influences and activities. I looked at the Oxford school system, um, testing results, um, events leading up to the shooting, a day of shooting and a review of uh, mental illness. Can I move to the next one? All right, so let's talk about uh, early childhood experiences. Um, can you discuss that? Absolutely. Um, again, you're only consulting uh, he something. He has the PowerPoint. Okay, it's, it's simply the PowerPoint? Yeah, this is a, sir, this is an exact copy. Let me step in. Anytime you're referring to something on the witness stand, the parties need to be aware of what you're looking at. And so you just can't just pick something up and start reviewing it. First, the defense attorney or the prosecutor has to prompt you to look at something. So what are you currently looking at, sir? Um, I have an exact copy of the PowerPoint that is on the screen, sir. Thank you. And that's the only thing that you're looking at right now? Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You may continue. Thank you. All right, so let's start again. Um, early childhood experiences. What did you come across when examining all of the evidence and discussing the matter with Mr. Crumbly? Certainly, I, in my review of the records, um, I saw that as, as early as age 10, um, matter of fact, even going back to age 6, there were some issues. Um, I interviewed a neighbor and looking at the records, which were corroborated, is that he was left <coughs> unattended as early as age six. He would go across to the neighbor's house, especially when there was like a thunder shower, and reported that he was afraid and would ask for help. And they would ask him where were his parents, and his response was, I don't know. Uh, in the records, uh, at age 10, um, there's text messages between Ethan and his mom saying to her, when are you going to come home? And there were no responses. Um, in my interview with Ethan, he explained that he spent countless hours watching um, 
various uh, adult um, uh, games. Um, some of them are in my uh, report, and uh, Assassin's Creed, um, Grand Theft Auto, and he also spent an inordinate amount of time going to different websites mm -hmm. and indulging in various uh, graphic, graphic scenes and indicated after a while he began to fantasize about being a part of those scenes. Mm -hmm. So he sort of lost track of reality. You also have listed trauma. What is trauma? Trauma is sort of an insult to the person, an insult to the brain. So it could be as a result of parental discord. Um, it could be as a result of high levels of anxiety or high levels of depression. Um, anything that insults the person's brain can be classified as trauma. What about constant stress from parents fighting? Yes. Uh, uh, Parental dysfunction, constant and intense dysfunction, can induce trauma. In my interview with Ethan, and in a review of the records also, there's frequent references to either parent threatening to commit suicide, and on some occasions, Ethan has had to be the one intervening at such a young age. What about um, the loss of a grandparent or the loss of an animal, especially in a violent death? Um, absolutely. Um, Ethan disclosed that one of his sort of soulmate was um, a large dog that, that um, he, uh, he had cherished, and um, it died at home, and he was the one tasked with having to remove it and take it back to the shed and figure out how to dis uh, dispose of it. And you saw the Google searches where he actually is looking how to dispose of a dog that has passed away. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am, that is correct. What about the loss of a best friend? Um, the loss of a best friend and perhaps your only friend uh, is, uh, could be a pretty traumatic experience, mm -hmm. as in the case of Ethan and a scene in the record, he spent hours and hours communicating with his best friend and mm -hmm. pouring out his heart and disclosing what was happening to him. Um, were you also told what his mother told him when that friend went away to a rehab? Yes, ma'am. And what was that? Um, she told him that he would probably never see his friend again. Let's move on. Dr. Keating, um, when he testified last week, touched on ACEs. Um, can you explain what that is to the court? Yes, so I think in 19, uh, 1995 and 97, my, my year could be off, the CDC <coughs> and Kaiser commissioned a study where they looked at 17,000 people. Um, and they, they have established what is called ACEs or Adverse Childhood Experiences. Mm -hmm. And what the research researchers saw was that between the ages of 0 to 18, children exposed to abuse, physical or emotional, uh, mental, um, parental dysfunction, or incarceration, the more ACEs someone has, the more likely they are to have mental health issues. In fact, what the research has discovered is that with six or more ACEs, the probability of that person dying 20 years earlier than their peer is greatly improved. Okay. And were you able to find a number of these factors when you interviewed um, Ethan as well as reviewed the records? Yes, ma'am. In a number of, of our conversations, um, you had discussed fa a feral child. What is a feral child? So a feral child, and I would love to read the definition if I can. If you can give us the definition, that would be fine. Certainly. It's essentially a child who has been abandoned. Um, initially, 
this phenomenon was known um, as someone who is abandoned physically. But then there is an emotional and a psychological um, construct to it. So what the researchers saw is that someone who is abandoned has what is called arrested development. Hence, they lack social skills. They lack social awareness. They lack social cues and essentially become misfits in society. And why do you feel that this is relevant in your review of this case? So when I interviewed Ethan and just looked at his, at his profile, um, at his high level of isolation, um, lack of parental support, lack of guidance, lack of resources, so psychologically and socially, he can be considered a feral child. You also had the opportunity to review some text messages between Ethan's parents, correct? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And Your Honor, just for your notes, it is Exhibit F. Thank you. I apologize, Exhibit G. <coughs> and in those text messages, were you able to see where they were discussing situations that Ethan was going through as early as March um, or even October of 2020? Yes. And what did those text messages show you? So, um, very clear indication um, that his parents were not in tune to what was going on with him. Um, in this string of text messages, he actually woke up in their room one day, and the mom and dad, was uh, they were exchanging text messages and, and they were sort of joking that Ethan was asking, what am I doing in you guys' role? And one of the text messages stated that he seemed to be under the influence of substances. And one parent asked the other, did you give him one of your Xanax? And she said, no, melatonin. Okay, so do those text messages show that Ethan was experiencing things that his parents at least were observing at this point. Yes, ma'am. Okay. All right, let's move to part two, which is the parental influences and activities. Um, I know that we touched on things that Ethan reported, the threats of suicide made in front of Ethan. Um, what else did you find that was interesting under this section? So under this section, um, Ethan witnessed um, just a litany of uh, verbal abuse, frequent taunts, and I guess the part that sort of stood out for me was when he told his, his parents that he was hearing voices and he needed to see a therapist. I don't know what 50-year-old raises his hand and says, my brain hurts, I need to see a therapist. And it never happened. What did you find out about the purchase of the gun and then going to the shooting range? So there seemed to have been discord between his parents. Um, I think his dad bought the gun out of spite, and then his mom took him took him to the shooting range out of spite because they were they were arguing. So there was constant just discord and family dysfunction. And in your interview with Ethan, um, did he report that he was ever taken to any sort of doctor to deal with this? In my review of the record, there was no indication that he was ever taken to a doctor. In your interviews and your discussion with him about the constant situations that were going on, was there constant arguments about divorce um, and which parent that Ethan would choose? Yes, ma'am. Okay, can you explain that a little bit? So, yes, it was frequent, uh, uh, just uh, harsh discussions about infidelity, 
um, suicide, um, and which parent Ethan needed to choose to live with when they separate or the event that they separated. Okay. We were able to look at the text messages between Ethan and his friend um, over the months leading up to um, November. I did. All right, and what's the significance that you found with those text messages? So, in reviewing those text messages, um, let me just say, Ethan had no idea that these text messages were going to be made public, and so he was having private conversations with his, with his friend. And in one of his text messages, which is on, on the uh, screen, he says that my mom thinks I'm taking drugs, but she doesn't worry about my mental health. In another of the text messages on the screen, he said, I have an effing breakdown in the shower. And in the text messages also, he said, from what my mom said last night, I went outside in my shorts, and I have no recollection of that event. And in another text message on your screen, he said to his friend, I am hallucinating. And he said, I hear like people talking to me. These were actual text messages back and forth between himself and his friend. Okay. I want to move next to part three. Uh, which is the Oxford school system. Were you able to take a look at the counseling that was available to Ethan at the school as well as the reports surrounding the school's interaction with Ethan the day prior and the day of the incident? Can you repeat that question? Sure. Um, were you able to look at Oxford school system and their counseling program as well as the interaction that the school system had with him the day before as well as the day of the incident? Yes, I did. Okay. And can you explain what you found? So what I, what I found was that in terms of the, of the uh, available resources for intervention, it, does not, it did not appear to me from my, from my review of the information that, that he was afforded any type of mental health uh, assistance. Okay. I'm going to move to the next one. All right. You also mention in your report implicit bias. What is that? Um, so implicit bias um, is it's sort of like the unconscious forces. You know, I can use an, an analogy of a peanut butter jar, mm -hmm. which is actually on one of the slides. Mm -hmm. And so a child learns how to use peanut from uh, peanut butter from a jar mm -hmm. because the child is taught by the parent how to do that. They learn how to um, un unscrew and cork and unscrew the peanut butter jar to get peanut from the uh, peanut butter. Mm -hmm. So after a while, they learn it so well that they're able to do it unconsciously. And the grooves on that bottle represent the grooves that society groups us with so that we have certain perception of things and people. Well, that's how implicit bias works. Let me give you another quick example. I was in court in uh, Detroit and about to step into the elevator, and there was an attorney and um, other people. I was dressed in suit and tie, and the attorney turned to me and said, counsel, come on in. I'm not an attorney. But he made the assumption, based on how I was dressed and how I comported myself, that I was an attorney. Well, that's how implicit bias works. So it's not necessarily a bad thing, nor a good thing. It's a thing, but it can have deadly consequences if it's not used appropriately. Okay. Now, um you also stated that you had a chance to look at the resources that were available to any high school student at Oxford High School. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay. And um, is there a rubric or is there a standard 
that is required for a school um, to have counselors, to have support staff, or to be able to help the students when they have issues? Certainly. So the, the American School Counseling Association, known as ASCA, this is sort of like the, the monitoring body that makes recommendation in terms of social worker to student ratio. So the recomm recommendation is that there be minimum one social worker to about 250 students. And what that body says is that if you have a ratio of one social worker to a thousand students, you are not even getting into the classroom. Okay. Were you able to find the data, um, and I know that it's contained in your report, regarding Oxford in the year prior and the year of the incident? Certainly. Okay. Um, and Your Honor, just because they're numbers, I ask if it's okay that he refer to his notes uh, just to get the numbers correct? Thank you. Any objection? No, Your Honor. Thank you. You may, sir. So in the 2019-2020 uh, school year, what was the social worker to student ratio in Oxford? So it was um, approximately one social worker to about a thousand students. What about 2020 to 2021? Um, it was one to one social worker to about 900 students. <coughs> and then what about 2021 to 2022? It was about one to about 900 students. Okay. So you went even a step further um, to look at suspensions and expulsions, is that correct? Yes, I did. And what were your findings? So in my research in the Oxford school system, um, just in terms of, of raw data, I saw that um, whites comprised about 80% of the uh, school district's um, enrollment. Um, and uh, blacks comprised, I think, about just under 5%. And uh, Hispanics, about 12%, which is reflective, I believe, of the society. So there was nothing um, revealing about that. However, when you begin now to disaggregate the data, because data tells you something, so that when you begin to disaggregate it, you see a pattern which is visible on your screen. So whites, 80% enrollment, and in terms of suspensions, 68% of the students suspended were whites. Blacks, enrollment, 5%. Suspension, 12%. Let's look at expulsions. Mm -hmm. Again, whites, 80% of the population. Expulsions, 44%, so about half. Blacks, 5% of the population. Expulsions. 22%. Hispanics, I think about 12% of the uh, population. Expulsions, 22%. What this data is telling you is very significant, is that all the students are suspended or expelled at a disproportionate rate when considered to the majority population. And then when you dig a little deeper, you have to ask yourself, what are we missing? And as it pertains to Ethan, as you will see, is that the students are not subject to the same degree of rigor, mm -hmm. which is why implicit bias is so important. Okay. And can you explain, just so it's clear, how implicit bias ties into these findings? Absolutely. Because... If you believe that a student is not a problem, you are less likely to pay attention to that student. Even if, even if 
you are shown overwhelming evidence about problems. Implicit bias says, you give this person a pass because that's how you've been groomed. You, you make certain assumptions. So you give certain people a pass based on your assumptions. However, if you give a person a pass who is a problem, it creates a bigger issue. So I want to go into a little bit of what you call a pass. You were shown a number of assignments that were found in Ethan's backpack, correct? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And you would agree with me that, um, in your honor, were, these exhibits can be found in Exhibit C. Thank you. There is a number of pieces of paper with guns, with bullets, and other alarming scenes drawn on them. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay. I know the prosecutor made mention that we aren't 100% certain um, that these were seen by teachers, but they were in his backpack and our school assignments. Correct? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Were you also able to look at emails between the teachers um, the day before this incident as well as the day of the incident discussing the uh, things that had come to light from the teachers trying to give warning to the people in the office. Yes, ma'am. Okay. And Your Honor, that's also found in Exhibit C. Thank you. And what did those emails show to you or how do they tie into implicit bias? So just looking at the emails, I was, uh, this red flags went up. One teacher said, and it's on their, their screen as an exhibit. Um, and this is from Ms. Kropinski. She said, I know Jackie emailed you guys yesterday with some concerns about Ethan Crumley in our first hour class. Today, he's watching <coughs> videos on his phone and a guy gunning down people it looks like it's a movie scene and not security footage, a real event, but definitely still concerning when taking into account some of his behaviors. I continue. And this is from Ms. Kubini. I had a student doing first hour. Ethan Crumley, who was on his phone looking at different bullets at the end of first hour today. As I was walking around the room passing out their essays, I didn't get a chance to investigate it a bit further since it was at the end of the hour. Now that he's on my radar, I'm also noticing that some of his previous work that he completed from early in the year, lean a bit toward the violent side. I can bring these down, these things later today during my fifth prep hour. And we can tell the time on that email is 9.33 a.m., correct? Yes, ma'am. Okay. The assignment um, that Ms. Kubina is talking about um, you had a chance to look at, and it's contained as well in my exhibit. It's a note card where a gun was erased, correct? That is correct. Okay. And the per there is also a drawing of a person with an arm outstretched with the gun, correct? That is correct. Okay. All right. So I want to get into the brain and mental illness. You can go to the next one. What is mental illness? So uh, it's a, a substantial disorder of thought or mood that significantly impairs um, judgment, behavior, and the capacity to recognize reality. Mental illness is actually a symptom of a deeper problem. So okay. for example, if someone has a chest pain, a chest pain is a symptom of a deeper problem. It could be a pulled muscle or it could be because of a heart attack. Mm -hmm. So mental illness is a sign of brain disease. Okay. 
So there are multiple ways to study the brain, is that correct? Yes, ma'am. Can you briefly discuss those different ways? Certainly. So one way is to look at the brain directly. So cardiologists look at the heart, dentists look at the teeth, and mental health people should look directly at the brain through various brain imaging techniques which are available. So that's one way. A second way is you want to test the brain directly through psychological instruments. Then a third way um, is what is utilized by psychiatrists and psychologists, and that is to use symptom clusters. So for example, if someone comes to me and they say, um, for the last month or so, I've not been sleeping well, I've not been eating well, um, I've been skipping out on work, I've been crying, I've been sad and blue. Then I go to the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, the DSM, and I look at symptoms. And if the person has, for example, five of these eight symptoms, then I can diagnose that person like with major depressive disorder. So that's the third way of looking um, at the brain. And then the last one really is not appropriate, and that is that you guess. So what you do, you say, well, because I see you acting in this way, and because you can plan, and because you can execute, and because you can do these things, I know that you're not ill or don't have a brain dysfunction. That is guessing. Okay. Mm -hmm. right. So were you able to actually look at Ethan's brain directly through imaging? I was not able to. Okay. So did you then decide to test the brain using assessment tools and perform a number of testing? Yes, that is correct. Okay. We'll go to the next one. Can you explain to us um, the brain and exactly how easy it is for the brain to be damaged in a variety of ways? Absolutely. So. Judge, I'd just like some foundation. No, I'm sorry, Judge. I'd like some foundation for this area. There's just no evidence in the record that this defendant suffered any brain damage. If you please lay more foundation. Absolutely. Were you able to view a video uh, taken at the 5 1 diner? Yes, I did. Okay. And in that video, actually, we'll go ahead and play it now so since what it's. What I would like to sure. emphasize. One second. She has to ask a question. I can't interrupt. Sure. Um, so were you able to, in your discussions with Ethan and the evidence that you were presented, were you able to, um, or did you have some concern that an injury to the brain could have occurred based on what he reported as a child and what you saw in this video? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Let's go ahead and play the video. This is my Exhibit R. There is no sound in this video. So this is from 2020. What did you observe on this video? So I observed um, Ethan walking in the diner and for some inexplicable reason, his head takes a direct hit to the, to the floor and observed him trying to get up on his own volition, mm -hmm. but he was not able to. And as we know, the brain is very soft. It has the consistency of soft butter or raw egg. And it's housed in this very hard box called the skull that has very sharp ridges. The brain is very susceptible to injury. And I would love to do a demonstration with your permission. Sure, Your Honor, he has a demonstration uh, to show with an egg as he described how exactly, how, how soft the brain is and how little it takes to injure the brain. Would the court allow? One Hold second. on. I'm sorry, someone was just approaching yes, without asking permission. 
I'm sorry, what exactly are you trying to do? Yes, Your Honor. My, my witness would like to demonstrate to the court how easy it is, as he described, the brain is like a raw egg inside of the skull. He would like to demonstrate to the court how easy it is, even a fall like this, to damage the inside of the brain. Thank you. Pete, what are you objection? Judge, I guess I just wonder what the, what the basis of that testimony is. It, it sounds like it's just Dr. King telling us. Um, and the, the idea that it's the consistency of an Ag Stevens report without citing anything. So like some foundation that this is not just Dr. King's theory. Thank you. Respectfully, your argument goes to the weight of this demonstrative evidence, and so the court will apply the appropriate weight. You may approach the witness. <coughs> And can you demonstrate, uh, since obviously this is a video courtroom and we're recording, can you demonstrate uh, or discuss what you're going to demonstrate? Absolutely. So as I previously mentioned, based so on... So you can be seated because I can't see what you're doing. My apologies, Your Honor. Thank you. So as I mentioned, uh, it's 100 billion neurons and a trillion connections in the brain. And this is scientific evidence. This is not my opinion. This is how the human, the human brain is... Uh, engineered, and it has the consistency of soft butter or raw egg. I've had the opportunity to visit the lab in Loma Linda. I have handled the human brain, and I s I've seen how the human brain works and how it looks like. It has the consistency of an egg. Ethan is about six feet, two inches tall. Um, and this is not six feet, two inches. This probably is about, I don't know, so be, before you move on, sir, please do not, if, are you going to drop this egg in the courtroom? Thank you. I can't see. I'm it. sorry, Your Honor. Thank you. Thank you. You may have seat, sir. Now, it makes it difficult for me if I don't stand, Your Honor. Thank you. You can stand now. I just can't see over this bar here, so I can't see what's below your chest area. So you may stand so that way I can see what you're doing. So, Ethan is six feet two, and this is less than two feet. That's the human brain. The reason why our brains don't collapse when we have an injury is because the brain is housed in this hard shell called the skull. This skull protects the brain from external injuries. So besides the incident that we saw at the 5-1 diner, did he also make you aware of other circumstances where he hit his head or even blacked out? Yes. Can you describe that? Yeah, Ethan uh, disclosed that he was out with his parents. I think they were picking strawberries or doing something like that. And, and he fell, and all he remembered was coming towards regaining consciousness. And he asked his parents what happened, and they said that he had taken a blow to the head. And there is no indication that he was taken to the emergency room or received medical assistance. In regards to the 5-1 diner video, um, you were shown <coughs> a report where the owner was interviewed, and in fact, his parents told the owner to not call 911 after that fall. Is that your understanding? Yes, that is correct. And in your interview with Ethan, um, did he ever tell you that at some point following that he was taken to the hospital or taken to the doctor to see, one, why he fell, or two, what happened from the fall? I saw no evidence of that. Okay, let's move on. Let's go through a couple of these more quickly. Let's just go to, let's go to part four. So keep clicking. We're going to move along to part four, which is Ethan's testing. Can you explain to the court the tests that you, um, you performed with Ethan? Certainly. So I uh, performed 15 different types of tests. And I wanted to, because there was no opportunity to image his brain, so I wanted to test his brain to see what his brain is like. Okay. And so there's the, there are a list of 15 tests here on the screen uh, in my report. Okay. Let's go through them. Uh, the evaluation of competency to stand trial. 
Why was this important? It was important because this is a test that is um, affirmed by the, uh, that is recognized, I should say, by the uh, U.S. Supreme Court in um, Dusky versus the people in 1960. And it essentially looks at three things. Does the person have the ability to consult with their attorney? Does the person have the ability to rationally understand the proceedings of the court? Does the person have a factual understanding of the proceedings of the court? And the reason why I administer this test is because I know that sometimes um, inmates feign or they fake. They try to pretend that something is going on when that is not the case. So when I administer this test, anything below 60 is normal, indicating that Ethan approached this test in an honest and open manner. In other words, he was not feigning. He didn't know the questions that pertain to feigning. Okay. And what were the results? Um, he does have the ability to consult with his attorney. He does understand the charges against him, and he does have a factual understanding of the charges. Okay. Let's move on to the next test, the mini mental status examination. What is that? It's, a, it's a, a test that has essentially 30 questions, and it tests the person's orientation. My reason for administering this is, again, this is one of the instruments that if someone wants to feign or fake, they can easily do that. For example, some of the questions are, what is the date? What is the day? Where are you? And Ethan answered all of those questions indicating on that day that he was oriented times three. Okay. Let's move to the next one. You did a survey of stress symptoms, is that correct? That is correct. Can you explain your findings? So on, on this instrument, uh, on the survey of stress symptoms, um, Ethan scored 39, indicating high levels of stress. And um, it was very clear to me that, 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 that he was approaching it in a very honest, test-taking manner. Okay. And can you describe some of the symptoms that this test addresses? Certainly. Anxiety, depression, uh, feeling overwhelmed, overwhelmed, sorry, loneliness, intrusive thoughts, um, fatigue, all of those are elements that are present in this test that he endorsed. Okay. Let's move to the next one, post-traumatic stress checklist for DSM-5. Can you explain what that is? Sure, it's an, it's an instrument that is based on the DSM-5, which is the golden standard of um, diagnosing mental illness. And so his score of 57 places him in a very high stress category that meets their DSM criteria. Okay. You then uh, did the Beck Depression Inventory. Can you explain that to the court? Sure, it's an, it's an instrument that uh, assesses for depression, um, uh, sadness, um, um, intrusive thoughts, malaise, um, and his score is 29, which is on that <coughs> higher level, indicating very high levels of depression. And again, you're performing these testings at least a year after uh, he has become incarcerated, correct? That is correct. Let's look at the next one. It's the Burns Anxiety Inventory. Can you explain to the court what that is? So that is a measure of one's anxiety, um, how, how anxious you are as a, as a person. And um, as we know, anxiety has a direct effect on the brain. Um, Ethan's score is 53, which is actually in the highest classification of anxiety. And does that finding of high anxiety um, fit into all of the other evidence you were looking at? The journal, the text messaging between his friend, and what he self-reported to you? That's correct. 
Let's now look at the brief psychiatric rating scale. Can you explain what that is to the court and what your findings were? Yeah, so this instrument looks at um, psychosis. And what is psychosis? Psychosis is a break from reality, um, as evidenced by um, auditory hallucinations and visual delusions. And um, he endorsed several of those items indicating the presence of psychosis. Okay. Let's now look at the Kaufman Brief Intelligent Test. Can you explain what that is and what your findings were? Yes, uh, the Kaufman Brief Intelligence Test is administered to test someone's um, level of intellectual functioning. The reason why I administered this instrument is I wanted to find out why was he failing in school. In my testing, if you have a very or an intelligent person who is failing in the classroom, it's a signal that there is something going on. And when I administered this test, I saw that his verbal IQ was 104. So average, anything above 8 to 5 to about 100, 110, falls in the average range. So he has average verbal IQ, average nonverbal IQ, and overall, average intelligence. You then went on to perform the wide range achievement test. Can you explain what that is and what your findings were? Certainly, in the state of Michigan for special education testing, you know, we administer the intelligence test and two achievement tests. So I administered the wide range achievement test just to see if I missed anything in terms of his ability to function in their classroom. And except for math, most of his scores were average to high average. Again, that's how we know that there's something else going on with someone who has average intelligence. Okay. Let's move on to the Weschler Individual Achievement Test. Can you explain what that is and what your findings were? So that is the second of the two achievement tests, the RAP and the, uh, and the uh, WIAP. Again, it's just to sort of double check your, your uh, uh, results. Um, and again, the scores are consistent with someone who has the ability academically to function in the classroom, but wasn't. Then finally, the Minnesota Multiphasic Personality mm. Inventory. What is that and what were your results? So that is, the MMPI is for, and this one is for adolescents, is regarded as the dean of tests to determine mental illness. Um, this test has been validated across various measures, and it's a test that psychologists use. Um, on the table to the left, um, his, that is his uh, PSY score. His score is 801. Anything over 60 means that the person has a number of those symptoms. Of mental illness. Of mental illness. Mm -hmm. So his score is 801, indicating someone who has high degrees of paranoia mm -hmm. and hallucinations. And then on the right, um, which is even more, more troubling, the uh, table on the right, he has elevations above 60 in two key measures. One is OCD, obsessive, compulsive, and anxiety. And I would love to explain what I mean by that. If you could, if you could explain obsessive compulsive to the court. So, there is a part of the brain called the cingulate gyrus. It runs from the front of the brain to the back of the brain. That is the brain gear shifter. It allows us to shift from one thing to the next. In Ethan's case, someone who scores highly on this measure, what it tells me that this person does not have the ability to shut off those thoughts. It's like 
being stuck on on. Mm -hmm. So you're with these thoughts every single day, every single night. And we see that with people who have OCD. He also has very high levels of anxiety, and those two tend to hang together. And as you notice in his journal, you notice that repetition, that I can't, the voices don't stop, my brain is on fire. Well, when I tested his brain, it's very consistent with what he was writing. Okay. Does the obsessive compulsive, compulsive disorder explain um, the constant searches on internet to look at violent things or to research things or any type of preparation and planning? Yes, ma'am. So let's move to the summary of um, the testing results that you performed. Um, do you believe that Ethan is a highly intelligent person? I do. Do you believe that he suffers from debilitating anxiety? I do. Do you believe that he is and was severely depressed? I do. Do you believe that he has features of obsessive compulsive disorder? I do. Were you able to determine that he was failing at school when, as you stated, he shouldn't have been? I did. And what exactly is your diagnosis for Ethan Crumbly? So major depressive disorder in addition to psychosis as evidenced by his verbalizing of hearing voices and seeing things. And by the way, about 12.5% of people with major depression experience major depression with psychosis. Okay. You have now had an opportunity after turning in your report to review the records from Dr. Kadir. Uh, she is the physician from the Easter Seals, is that correct? That is correct. Would you agree with me that um, you have similar findings but not exactly the same? That is correct. Do you have an explanation for that? Yeah, that is not, that is not unusual. Um, diagnosing mental illness um, is not an exact sign, so you go based on symptoms. So um, Dr. Kadir, based on my review of her notation, diagnosed him with, I think, major depressive disorder and uh, I think an adjustment disorder going on with anxiety memory, with anxiety which which is not unusual but I believe as she, as she continues if she continues to treat him um, once he has the depression and anxiety under control if he's still verbalizing hearing voices and seeing things then she may add that diagnosis. So it's not inconsistent. Add the diagnosis of psychosis or something else? Correct. Of psychosis. Okay. So you have told us from your results um, that Ethan is of average, if not above average, intelligence, correct? Yes, ma'am. So shouldn't he have known better? Shouldn't he have not done this because he's a smart kid? So unfortunately, intelligence, and this is this is critical. Intelligence does not protect someone from mental illness. So being very intelligent doesn't mean that you cannot be mentally ill. Okay. Do you have any real world examples? I do, I do. Um, Robin Williams, very intelligent Hollywood actor, but he was mentally ill. How do I know that? Well, he killed himself. He committed suicide. Um, Twitch. We've seen that publicly. A very talented man on Ellen DeGeneres' uh, show. Um, extremely talented. I actually watched watched a video of him the day before he killed himself. He was dancing with his wife and daughter, and then the next day he drove to the hotel and killed himself. Mental illness is real. All right. Were you able to watch any videos that were provided to you from body cam footage um, of Ethan at the jail? I did. Your Honor, I'm going to play what is in my exhibits as S body cam jail footage. There are a few videos, um, but we have shortened them. This is sound, so I don't know if we can have your staff just make sure the sound is working. Perfect.
witness someone who's saying God why didn't you stop it and that's exactly how psychosis works you Wait. engage in an action and somehow you don't understand the outcome of the consequences he's having a panic attack and a break with reality we also hear him saying you could have saved her that is correct. In any part of that video, do you see Ethan being violent? No, ma'am. Are mental health issues perfect? I mean, he's obviously been on medication now for a period of time, and things like this obviously can still happen. What is your explanation to that? So, medications are not an exact science. There's different levels of titration. There are times when some medications work, and there are times when they don't always work, just like in the physical realm. I want to move on to part five. So you were able to look at the events leading up to the shooting, correct? That is correct. All right. Did Ethan disclose to you um, a situation where he actually brought casings to school and displayed them on his desk? He did. Can you explain that? Certainly. Um, he indicated to me that he brought one light round, and actually my review of the records and with the detective that interviewed some of the students, one of the students did confirm that Ethan showed him a light round and shell casing. So I have no reasons to doubt what he said, that he placed some shell casings mm -hmm. on the desk in his class, and the teacher walked by, didn't name the teacher, and I said to him multiple times, are you sure? And he said yes. You were made aware and you were able to see some interviews about the events of November 30th in the counseling office, correct? That is correct. Okay. Um, and it was your understanding that he was caught looking at websites dealing with ammunition? That is correct. Okay. Were you able to look at the actual school assignment that was the cause of him being taken to the office that morning? where he wrote certain things and drew certain things. That is correct. Okay. Were you also able to discuss with Ethan um, the video that the court has been shown that was filmed the night before? Yes, ma'am. And you've had an opportunity to review that video? I have. Can you explain that video or give it some context? So this was a night before the shooting when Ethan recorded himself, appeared to have been using a cell phone in terms of what he was planning to do the following day. And during certain parts of the video, um, he made references to, to demons. And then in the video he said, I am the demon. It, it just, indicates the, the fragmentation in his head in terms of what was happening. Okay. And what was your understanding about why he was outside at that point in time? What did he tell you had gone on in the home leading up to him being outside? I think his parents had locked him out of the house um, and they had taken some, some money from him. Okay. 
And was that in relation to grades? Yes, because he was stealing some of his classes. And how did he feel about that? Um, terrible, um, in terms of how they were treating him. The video um, that the court has viewed, and I know you have viewed, it, it seems just like a rambling of thoughts. That is correct, okay. just sort of scrambled thoughts. And do you believe that that is part of what mental illness can do to you? Yes, ma'am. Let's talk about the actual day of the shooting. Um, did Ethan ever tell you if he had been asked if he had a gun by any school professionals or the, the parents that day at school? No. And is it your understanding um, from speaking to Ethan that he was allowed to stay in school that day? Yes, he was allowed to stay in school. And can you explain the situation involving his backpack or how he explained it to you? So this is how he explained it to me after he was called down to the office. He left his backpack in the classroom. And then he indicated that, I think it was Ejac, I could be butchering his name, I do apologize for that went to get his, to retrieve his backpack. And Ethan said, for the first time in his life, he felt relieved. He said, he just knew that the sheriffs were going to burst into the office and arrest him because there was no way, after all that they saw, that they were not going to search that backpack. In fact, this is a comment he made that has stuck with me. He said one of the Hispanic students was suspected of using drugs, and he remembered them searching that kid's locker. And he felt fairly sure that they were going to search his backpack. When Ejac brought the backpack into the office, he made a comment. He said, this is heavy. What do you have in here? Bricks? And then Ethan said, all he had to do was just unzip that backpack, but he didn't. So the best of your knowledge after speaking with Ethan and reviewing all of the records, the backpack was not searched, correct? It was not searched. So obviously at that point, Ethan had the opportunity to volunteer the information that he had a weapon in his bag. Would you agree with me? That is correct. Can you explain why you believe that did not happen? He was in a state of ambivalence. Do I tell do I not tell? Do I do this? Do I not do this? What is going to happen if I tell? So that's the state of flux that he was in. So I want to kind of put it all together for the court. So you've told us about a complex childhood full of trauma, correct? That is correct. Violence in the home. That is correct. Mental illness. That is correct. A lack of resources. No one's getting him the counseling that he needs. That is correct. Neglect. That is correct. Access to weapons. That is correct. In a school system with not enough counselors. That and where correct. did that lead us? Tragedy. I want to move on to part six. I know you've touched on quite a bit of this already. There's been testimony and there's been um, some argument about Ethan looking up or talking about going to prison. Is it normal that a 15 year old would just be okay with the fact that he's gonna do something that lands him in prison? So teenagers go through a phase that is called personal fail. And if I may give you an example. Sure. A teenager may be driving 
a hundred yards away, the light is about to turn red. Mm -hmm. They think that they can magically feed that red light and nothing bad is going to happen to them. It's because their brain, their prefrontal cortex, this is the brain supervisor, mm -hmm. is not fully developed just biologically and physiologically. The human brain, the prefrontal cortex, is not developed until about age 24, 25. In Ethan's case, he has what is called arrested development. Can you explain what that is? Absolutely. So chronologically, he may have been 15 at the time, but given the high levels of stress and complex trauma, his age was much younger than his chronological age. You've been able to see through the text messages and actually in your interviews with Ethan, he reported that he was not sleeping and he was not eating. How does that tie into mental illness? So the brain consumes about 20 to 30 percent of the calories that we consume. So whatever we consume, the brain consumes about 20 to 30 percent of that. So sleep deprivation and lack of uh, appropriate nutrition greatly impact the body. Our bodies were not meant to be in a state of high anxiety perpetually. You've also been able to take a look at the Google searches that he was do doing and a lot of them are looking kind of for self-diagnosis, looking up what is depression, um, do I have ADHD, do I have obsessive compulsive disorder, what do you make of that? So here is a child who was just trying to, to make sense of his inner world. He couldn't get help from his parents, from the home system. He couldn't get help from the school system. He couldn't get to a doctor. He couldn't get to a counselor. So his last resort was to try to figure out what, what's happening to me. Is this, is this normal? Um, am I depressed? Am I anxious? Am I a sociopath? Who am I? He's trying to make sense of what's going on within him. You've also been shown a number of searches that were, do were done on a particular website where very violent videos, actual murders, actual shootings um, are, are categorized and, and people can view them. What is your understanding of what that does, especially to an adolescent's brain? So during adolescence, the, the, the person's brain, brain is still in the formative stage. The neurons are still trying to connect. And if one spends an inordinate amount of time ingesting that type of content without supervision, before long, it's natural to lose sight of what is real and what is not real. Okay. Now, you've been made aware that there was a situation at the jail um, with a password and a tablet, correct? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And can you explain what you believe to have happened um, in this situation? Certainly. So, Ethan was given um, a tablet. And because he's an, a fairly intelligent person, he was able to figure out the password and was able to go on the internet and use as a tablet. And what he indicated to me is that although he had the urge to go to the, to the live gore site, he was able to restrain himself, which he's pretty proud of, two weeks just did not go to the site, um, but eventually went there. And what does that, can you give that a context? What does that mean to you? Is he regressing? What, can you give an explanation to that? So when you make a comparison of what he was doing prior, he was ingesting that content constantly, every day, hours and hours at a time, and 
in my mind, it shows progress, not perfection, but progress. Were you able to view uh, the videos of Ethan killing baby birds? I did. Can you discuss the significance of that and what you think and how you think it fits into this case and his diagnosis? Absolutely. Uh, I <coughs> observed um, Ethan um, torturing baby birds. He wanted them to feel the pain that he was feeling inside. And I observed his persona. Um, he was actually speaking to them in a different tone of voice, almost as a parent talking to a child. It's just a reflection of, of his, his mental impairment. What about, um, he talks about a desire to kill, or he wants to find another set of baby birds so that he can kill them. Can you explain that? It sort of lines up with my testing of his brain. Um, I indicated that his obsessive compulsive um, scales, I think his score was eight to one, indicating that this part of the brain, this singular gyrus, is on fire meaning that it's hard to turn it off and without appropriate intervention, without treatment and medications, that part of the brain is stopping on. Okay. What about the fact that when the police come in, Ethan surrenders, um, and then in the police car acts normal? I mean, he's not, he's not <coughs> talking to voices, he's not flailing about. Can you explain that? Certainly, it's, a, it's a, a, um, a phase called tension reduction. So tension is something that is built up. Anxiety, obsession, anxiety, obsession. I guess a good analogy is to uh, think in terms of like a, a, a pressure cooker. It's on the stove and it's boiling and there's tension building up in there. And the one way for that tension to go away is when you release that now, the tension goes out and you revert to equilibrium. So tension reduction, tension reduction cycle. So is your explanation then, once he carried out this plan that he was so fixated on, <clears throat> he had that sense of reduction or accomplishment? Absolutely. <laughs> it's an, um, analogous to what we just witnessed. So the person <coughs> in the videos is the same person in the courtroom. There's no difference. It is the same person. I want to talk about the report that you authored. Um, obviously, in giving the history that you did, you've been doing these regular types of analysis outside of the courtroom for many years. You would agree with me? That is correct. Okay. So how is it that you came to start doing the work that you're doing now for Miller hearings? We were so in, I think it was around uh, 2019, an attorney reached out to me and, um, and asked me if I would do one of the Miller hearings. Mm -hmm. And I was fairly confident in my ability as a psychologist, um, in my ability to clinically interview someone, in my ability to test someone. But in terms of crafting a legal report, I was a neophyte. It was not my area of expertise. And so I reached out to the attorney and said that if <coughs> I'm to do this, this report. I'm going to need you to reach out to your sources, obtain copies of their report, make sure you get their permission, um, because I plan to use uh, the uh, rubric and extract some of the legal language in my report. And that is 
2019 to 2025 clients ago. And that is the exact format that I've been using. And that's what you did in this case? Yes, ma'am. Were you able to form an opinion whether or not Ethan Crumbly was mentally ill on November 30th of 2021? Yes, ma'am. Right. And what is that? Um, he has major depressive disorder with psychosis, anxiety, and features of obsessive compulsive disorder. He is mentally ill. And in all of the testing that you did and the interviews, do you believe that there is the possibility of rehabilitation? I do. And can you explain that? Certainly. Um, as I indicated, um, I've worked in the field of brain injury for 25 years. I take pride in my work. I've treated people with stroke, CBA. I've treat, treated people with anoxic brain injury and I've treated people with mental health. And along with my team, we have been able to rehabilitate people. A number of my clients have had uh, issues with the law and through psychotherapy and support, they've made progress. Additionally, and this is important, in neuroscience, there is something called neuroplasticity. And that is the ability of the brain to create new pathways, to generate new neurons. You see this in stroke victims. Mm -hmm. It's a stroke on the left-hand side, it's right-hand side neglect. But those are the people that I've worked with and taught them how to speak again and how to walk again and how to function. So absolutely yes. So people with mental illness, especially ones that do something you know, e extremely serious that, le that leads them down a path that they find themselves in prison. I know Dr. Keating touched on this a little bit, but you believe that, especially based on Ethan's age, that his brain can rewire and he can stop the behaviors that he was exhibiting previously. Is that correct? That is correct. Ethan's brain is still maturing, um, and his brain probably will not reach full maturity for another 10 years. Are the clinical opinions in your report based solely on the testing and your interaction with Ethan Crumbly that you yourself performed? So my conclusions are based on my clinical interview of Ethan Crumbly and are based on the results from my testing. I have no further questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Cross. Um, Your Honor, uh, the doctor has actually testified that a whole lot of things are not in his report, and could we take a short break before cross-examination? Sure. We'll go ahead and take about a 10-minute break. Deputies, if you could, go ahead and take the defendant back downstairs. To those in the gallery, please be seated until the defendant has exited the courtroom.